guys welcome welcome this is such a special night um lindy can't be with us tonight but she's watching and so i want to make her proud and i want to host a great show for you guys uh from lindy love you guys and i wish i was there i wish you were here too so uh what we have is uh we're just going to do a little bit of a shorter call tonight we're going to end right at the hour but i have our awesome SBG coaches with us tonight. So welcome everybody. Go ahead and put in the chat where you're uh, watching from. We'd love to say hi and see where you're tuning in from. And um, Coach Raymond, I'm going to have you start. Go ahead and introduce yourself. Hi, I'm uh, Coach Raymond. I've uh, been a carnivore for about six years now, uh, almost six and a half years. I've had a lot of uh, deliberating issues, uh, just many problems. My biggest problems was probably diverticulitis and uh, heel spurs, plantar fasciitis. I've had sleep apnea, just a ton of issues. I was eating the SAD diet before and my SAD diet approach was more like a gallon of Pepsi a day, microwave food, uh, junk food. I got to the point where I... Uh, according to the doctors, I needed to do a, uh, a surgery for my diverticulitis, but I opted to go the nutrition route. And th this is because I found out I was pre-diabetes and pre-diabetic. And I, I did keto for a year. And then uh, six years from that, I did carnivore, but that totally transformed my outward appearance and my inward appearance. So it's been a great success for me. Amazing. Amy, go ahead. I'm about 19 months carnivore and I was able to go through the calendars and the programs under Coach Raymond and Coach Emily, which I'm very thankful for. Uh, I've been able to heal stage three kidney disease with carnivore and fasting. And uh, I also ended up losing 70 pounds under Steak and Butter Gang. Uh, under the tutelage of Raymond and Emily. And lastly, uh, the other big thing I had happen was I ended up with septic shock uh, while I was already carnivore. And the doctors and nurses were amazed that I lived through it. And I truly believe that it is because of the carnivore diet. Phenomenal. I feel like you guys took that healing first approach and got so many benefits happening. And I'm so honored that we get to hang out tonight. Uh, Y'all that are watching, uh, feel free to post uh, questions. We can answer questions for you guys, but we do have some really special topics. We were coached together this morning uh, with some the clients and just some things came up about the carnivore journey. And uh, to me, it's like this, this mental health piece. And, um, you know, we talk a lot about sugar, sugar addiction and recovery and what goes through our minds during this process. And what, uh, what are some kind of mental tools that can help us with this? And we landed on something and I was like, ah, this is so exciting. So get ready uh, because we're going to go into some details about some very specific techniques that you can use in your thought process. And uh, we might go through some of those here in our conversation and see how that goes. Why not? Let's try it. <laughs> Love it. So uh, Coach Raymond, I heard you first start talking about this and uh, SPG calls. And uh, it seems like that Amy has brought in something forward to your awareness and helped you kind of solidify and identify some things that you've actually observed over the years. I want to hear about that process. Well, so this is about uh, kind of re really learning about myself first. So really learning about my hunger cues first and what's going on. Cause you know, there's, there's a little bit of programming that kind of happens to us when we're going through the habitual, um, 
eating kind of blankingly and of course going into the into searching for the endorphins and searching for the that little extra hit that we're trying to do and so that made me think how did carnivore really change that first of all you know uh, priming was was a big thing for me because once i started doing that i started having the detachment from the food so once I started having the detachment from the food, I could actually watch myself before I could even watch myself eat because I was going on it like a, you ever had that feeling where you're just instinctually eating? You're like, I'm hungry, I'm eating, you know? And it's usually like a hungry, like you just can't stop yourself. And I've even had it where I was like, I can't eat because I don't want to be fat, right? But it would always overtake me. And I could not watch my habits because I didn't have one. I was just going straight into the fridge, you know, grabbing the, 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 the super sweet stuff first. At least that's what I think I did. You know, if I were trying to think back what I did. But with carnivore, it made me actually be able to think before I went into what I ate. I actually thought, hey, you know, I'm going to eat the steak. And even if I had a thought of, of going for any other things before I used to say, I'm going to eat a steak first. So that was a portion of the reprogramming, but um, yeah. So I want to hear from you guys on all this stuff too. Awesome. awesome. Yeah. So um, I, I just love kind of breaking it down and hearing those thoughts and coming into that observer role. Yes. Um, and oh gosh, Amy, I think you, uh, used a term and it was, it had to do with exposure. And so there was something about, um, facing things and looking at things actually, um, from the observer perspective. And so what does that mean? And like, uh, I think I heard you say exposure processes or therapy or something like that. Tell me a little bit oh, more yeah. about that. We did talk about that. So recently I started examining myself and how I react to stress. And I am a sugar addict. So every time I've had stress, I've sat at my desk and eaten tons of sugar. One uh, Halloween, I bought a huge box off of Amazon of those Sour Patch Kids. Mm -hmm. And they were individually wrapped. And I ate all of them before Halloween came. And I had to individually unwrap each one that's the kind of sugar addict i am hundreds of pieces of whatever and so when you go through the carnivore journey it's not like uh coach raymond said today it's not linear there are bumps uh soul searching uh things that you didn't think would trip you up that do setbacks i I healed my kidney disease and ended up coming home from uh, getting cleared by my doctor for no more blood work. Mm -hmm. And I had gummy bears in my hand mm -hmm. at my desk. And I literally just saved my life over the course of eight months. It took me and I ate those gummy bears and gained all the weight back plus 30 pounds more. Did the so, kidney disease come back too? No, because that's what scared me. When I finally started to feel like my ankles were swelling and I started to feel fatigue, uh, brain fog, all the things I felt with my kidney disease. And then I weighed myself. <clears throat> Not This was uh, a while later. It took me about nine months to gain all that back. And... I thought, here comes my kidney disease and other blood work problems that I had, pre-diabetic, all of that. That scared me, brought me back to my life or death, uh, life or death thing. That's what we decide, right? When we are deciding to do carnivore, so many of us have a, a life or death thing going on where we decide to live and then we start doing carnivore. That's why we're so extreme in how we approach things because most of us have already been to the spot where we have to make the decision whether we're going to keep doing what we're doing or we're going to live. And so I decided I wanted to live. And that time 
when I started carn carnivore, and luckily it has stuck now 19 months. But it could be any moment, any moment I could be back. The advantage of steak and butter gang is there's there are two unique things. The first unique thing that I was exposed to was priming. And priming is nourishing yourself and making yourself so full of carnivore food that you don't crave anything else. Well, really, it's a detachment. So once you prime, it puts your, your brain in a detached mode where you're not tied into your sugar addiction or your food addiction because you're tired of eating. Right. And that is unique. It's automatic detachment. Well, you don't stay in priming the whole time, right? So <clears throat> once you get through priming, you start to fast, you start to learn how your body reacts to different fasting modalities. Coaches talk you through it in the meetings, but I'm still a sugar addict. Right. And I still have my first impulse is still to reach for sugar. So I started thinking about this and how that priming detachment helped me and wondering if I could reenact that. So I started thinking about watching myself from the outside and detaching myself from every little emotion. And that led to this exposure therapy that my daughter who uh, had severe OCD learned exposure therapy. And I started thinking about if that would help. And what it really is, is I have an, obs let's say I have an obsession <clears throat> and my obsession is financial problems, something mm -hmm. like that. That that's something that we all think about at one point or another. So my financial problems might consume me and they might make me want to eat something sugary. Mm -hmm. Su eating something sugary is the compulsion. Okay. That's what we, a lot of us listening and here have done. We have the stress and then to get rid of it out of our brains, to detach from it, we eat sugar. Well, what if instead of doing that, we started to retrain our brains like they do with this with this therapy called exposure therapy. And so you feel the stress and it's usually in the moment, right? Your first mm -hmm. answer should be physiological, like the coaches say. Physiological answer is eat some fat, eat some meat, okay? That should always be your first answer because it's mostly physiological. If you have an addict's brain, then your addict's brain is going to reach for sugar. You stop it with food, okay? But it doesn't, doesn't always work. So your second answer is to let the stress go ahead and rise inside you. Feel it. And then feel the stress. Mm -hmm. That's exposure. Then, that's that's yeah, the exposure right there. You're exposing yourself to the stress. Normally, you'd reach for something to get rid of it, to distract right. yourself from it. Okay? We're not reaching. We're exposing ourselves to the stress. Mm. You let yourself feel it. And the, the ending... The ending of that is you're going to pick a statement. So the statement might be, oh, maybe I'm going to be poor and homeless and live on the street, or maybe not. I don't really know, but I'm just going to go forward and let it go. Whoa. And so go with the worst case scenario kind of thing, scare yeah, yourself you say, like, and then say, right. okay, wh what's it like to be homeless and, you know, poor? Right. Right. And that's just a thought you're doing in your head. It's a thought you what put in your head and then it goes. Yeah. You're reenacting a normal brain. Okay. How many of us have normal brains? Hardly anybody, but you're reenacting a normal brain. And a normal right. brain will drive on a mountain road yes. and say, I might drive over the side accidentally. Okay. Yes. And then it goes right back out of your brain. But an obsessive brain will drive on the mountain road and say, I might drive over the side accidentally. Oh my God, I'm going to drive over the side accidentally. Yeah, what I if know. I drive over the side accidentally and it's that. obsession? Yeah. So if you retrain your brain to say, I might drive over the side accidentally, 
and I might die. I'm just going to keep driving. Blind. That's right. what a normal brain does. It's a right. fleeting thought. You don't even know you do it. And then it's out of your brain. So what if this is hard to do because I've been trying to do it. But what if when you have your craving and you want to go back to your pre-primed, you know, you're not priming, you want to go back, then you've got to try and do that. Try and feel the stress so yeah. that you can retrain your brain with your, your casual statement or your casual thought. I don't really know if it's... Uh, something that would work for everybody, but I feel like I don't want to go back to coach Raymond's priming every time I have cravings. <laughs> so I'm, <laughs> I'm going to keep trying to do it. Well, I want to say, Amy, so the good parts of what you're saying here to me, if we were going to do this, for example, let's say we have a craving for a specific thing, like, let's say I have this cake sitting out there or brownies. Okay. Sitting out there in my counter and uh, because, you know, you have kids or whatever life, you know, happens to have that there. The thing is, is that I, what I did back then is I actually imagined myself taking it, eating it, imagining how sweet it was, swallowing it, digesting it, even feeling what I'd feel like later on. Yeah. And then what I did is I've never allowed myself to actually have that brownie. And if I really wanted it bad enough, I would have to, usually I said, I have to have a ribeye or even butter. And I, every time I did that, I didn't want it as much. So it's all about the, how intense I wanted it. Right. At that time, when I wanted it intensely, it's, you can have that daydream opportunity, daydream about it, and then reach for some, have some rule that kind of buffers having it. And that's what I did. And it's okay to have it too. I even told myself this because I know me. If I tell myself I can't have it, I'm going to want it more. I don't know yeah. if you're the same way. Well, I look at uh, Instagram food pictures when I'm fasting. Oh, I don't yeah. know why it satisfies me, but yeah. it's like, uh, you know, we've talked, the three of us have talked about this before that the more unemotional you are about your eating, the better. It's like Carol said, she ate wrong today and she's still beating herself up. Oh my goodness. I know that story. Yeah. So, but Don't that's that. not the deal, right? So right. you beat yourself. There's, it's not a matter of will. It's a matter of brain response. So mm -hmm. the brain responds to priming and priming disassociates you from your cravings. And the brain responds to exposing yourself and then having your casual statement which disassociates you from your cravings. What do you think? What do you think, Coach Emily? Well, I am just like listening and learning and I'm taking notes. These are all things that I know and understand and have experienced, but this is what happens in community and in synergy when three people who are in recovery. And so I, I there's a reframe I do is like when we know how important it is that we have our sugar addiction call, in our in uh, with Bella, and then I think, well, I don't like to think of myself as an addict. I like to think of myself in recovery. Is that a reframe, Amy? How am I doing? How about instead of that, recovered? Recovered. Oh. So yes, you tell your story of who you want to be. So if you say you're an addict, I'm sorry. I know I, I say it sometimes too. If we say that, then we'll always be in that loop. So we need to believe who we are as the one that recovered. I think that's how it works. That's what I've heard anyways. But anyways, I don't know how to do that properly. Well, when people go through uh, AA, they call themselves recovered Yeah. instead of recovering. Thank you for saying that. I knew it. That makes sense. Yeah. So that's why I suggested recovered because... We know all of us here, once you cross the, sh the threshold into having some success with carnivore, then you really have changed your mindset about food. Sure. We, and it changes how we function in the world almost. We're not the same person anymore. That's We're not the same person. And okay. so um, 
but unfortunately it's not a, a sticker, you know, and, and now you're all set up and packaged and ready to go. It's a constant journey. And I'll just plug, <laughs> I'll plug steak and butter again because I'm, I'm steak and butter, uh, steak and butter gang biggest fan. So you have to have community yeah. because you can't detach yourself from your biggest stress reliever. You can't detach yourself from what you've been doing for decades to relieve your stress and not have other people who are struggling with you. It doesn't have to be even more than one person, but there aren't very many carnivores, right? And there aren't very many carnivores. That no. So you have to have a community. Uh, even if you're the kind of person that doesn't think you need that thing or doesn't you maybe you're introverted you still need to have some people in your life who are struggling the same way that you are because you get to see them succeed and fail and you get to use the knowledge that they gained while they were succeeding and failing and steak and butter gang you not only have community but you have coaching and so the coaches have already been through all this and watched all these people go through it and it's pretty powerful. It can help you stay on track while you're struggling. And you have a place to be heard. That to me is another piece I feel like that's extremely important. I love it when members speak up or write in the chats. It's There's something about being heard that seems to matter that actually helps us out more than even the advice that you know we give or anybody gives. Just being heard. It's like, oh my gosh, I'm being heard. And it makes a difference. So I think that's another aspect of community because most of the times we're, we're, we're fighting with our family that will not hear us. They won't even hear mm -hmm. us as far as uh, what we're eating and it's totally not respected. So it's nice having a place that you can actually be heard and understood as a bonus. Yeah. And you might think that coach Emily and coach Raymond look really uh, put together and everything but they've already been through all this and still go through it. I don't think coach Raymond does. Um, oh, he doesn't struggle. <laughs> yeah. But the deal I'm is, that, Come on now. yeah, obviously I don't want any of that stuff. There's no dogma. Okay. So you might have been exposed to some other uh, communities or pundits, but there's no dogma there. People talk about, what they did that wasn't carnivore and there's no judgment there's only a process and learning from the process and i, re I really like that okay do you guys want to help me with with uh yesterday i'll tell you what happened we celebrated easter a week late and um at <laughs> and those of you who watched okay. a couple weeks ago you know, I have an issue with um, chocolate, chocolate bunnies. Like it's been like a huge part of my past. I eat their ears. I eat their, oh, little right. you know, all this stuff. I remember and, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's been a long time. I haven't touched for a long time, um, yeah. but there was all this stuff out and I didn't, I didn't buy it or contribute this year, which was great, but I kept thinking I wanted it. And I was, um, you know, I was in charge of bringing cold cuts. So I brought turkey, salami, and I had a couple little steak bites in the fridge for myself that I'd already prepped at home. But I was just still like, I want that. I want that. And I would go by there and I'd see it and I would think it. And so how, what, what, based on this, what we're talking about, like, how would I handle this? Cause I, I'm hearing things about detach. I'm hearing things about compulsion, stress, pick a statement and expose. Can you guys help so me? If you really did it, like with the, I can totally relate. These Easter time is, uh, my, was my favorite sugar time of the year, right? I, it's all the best. It's all the best sugar. Yeah. So, Cadbury, egg, what, yeah all that. Cadbury eggs. What was it that you wanted? The chocolate, <laughs> chocolate bunny, bunny, the hollow, you know, they'd have that giant <laughs> bunny that's in a tin foil that's hollow. You know what I'm talking about, right? You yeah. Those, right? Lint, yeah. Lint. Yeah. So, this is what you would actually do. You would go into the store and you you would see it like you just did. And you'd think, I want that like you thought. Mm -hmm. And then you would go walk over to it and you'd stand right in front of it. 
And then you, you would let whatever thing in you that triggers you wanting that comfort, stress, maybe, uh, you know, just a sense of fulfillment. <clears throat> I always had a sense of fulfillment when I ate a chocolate bunny. And so you just, you just look at really? it. Oh gosh. Yeah. Fulfillment. Yeah. It's Don't judge us, Coach Raymond. No, I'm sorry. Don't judge us. We're non-dogma. I mean, for me, for me, no, 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 no. For me, it was not a fulfillment. It was like a high. Yeah. I didn't get just, a fulfillment, not like I do in steak. And then I just wanted to eat the whole thing. You know, I wanted to dissect well, the bunny. The whole, there's no reason not to eat the whole thing once you start it. Yeah. But I remembered. That's why I don't go, go get it because I know one bite's never enough. And so yeah. in my situation yesterday, they were all in these like stupid plastic eggs and there was a whole thing of them. And it would have been nothing. All the adults were just going by and skimming, you know, it was for the children, but you know, we were all skimming a little bit and not me, but, and I was just like, nobody would even know, nobody they would see it. Yeah. And, right. But I knew that I had another thought that maybe this is my honest thought that one is never enough. Right. And it was just like, started a whole nightmare of more and more and more. But talk me through, Amy, talk me through the process. Okay. So then you would little, literally say, I'm going to go ahead and feel whatever feeling I have that makes me want to eat these chocolate bunnies. You know, whatever's going on, life stresses, you just let it, let it, let yourself feel it and let it rise up in you so that you actually feel it like a dork in the store, be a dork in the store mm -hmm. or in your car or whatever. And then mm -hmm. after you have sufficiently exposed yourself to your, you pick your statement and your statement might be, well, uh, like maybe your stress coach, Emily is being a sugar addict. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, if we could, if we could get rid of that and get rid of that part of us we would so you might say i might eat this chocolate bunny and the next chocolate bunny and i might die of diabetes or some terrible wow. slow death i don't really know i'm just gonna go on with my day and mm -hmm. then you go because that's what a normal brain does. Mm -hmm. Like somebody who's a normal, my, my parents, I'm at my parents right now helping them out. And my mom bought those uh, Cadbury mini eggs. Mm. I don't know if you know what they are, but oh, they're yeah. delightful. Yeah, they're, <laughs> you know what they, they are. are. <laughs> they have a hard shell and then milk chocolate on the inside. Yeah. And my mom and dad are not sugar addicts. So sure. these things sit in a bowl on a counter yep. or whatever. Well, I could eat the whole thing. Okay. Yeah. Oh yeah. No problem. Yeah. So in my mind, I'm like, my parents don't have to do that. It's my brain that has to do that. It has to say, I might fall off carnivore and I might not, I might not fall off carnivore. I might successfully have the health numbers and the body composition I want, and I might not. Uh -huh. I'm just going to go ahead and go to the next day. That's what you have to do because you have to expose yourself to the stress. Mm -hmm. And then you have to retrain your brain so it starts doing that same sequence by itself. That's what the exposure and the casual response does is to retrain your brain so that you don't have to do that at the grocery store anymore when you see the chocolate bunnies. So that maybe by next Easter, you walk right by them like Coach Raymond does now. Mm -hmm. You walk right by them and they don't phase you. They still phase me. Hopefully next year, I'll be able to not be phased by it because I'm doing this sequence to expose myself and then tell my brain it's not a big deal. Mm -hmm. You know, I love that. And how did I do coach Raymond? Because what happened is I did have that thought. I was like, well, if I have one, one's never enough. And yeah. I was going to want more and more and more, but I didn't freak out about that. I was still just like, you know, if that choice would have happened, it would have happened. And I just mm -hmm. thought, eh, I'm going to go get some more meat. And I just kind of went okay. back there and it, was, it wasn't like, oh, I need more meat or I'm going to 
fall off the wagon. I'm not going right. to be clever anymore. I didn't awfulize the whole situation. So I feel like I maybe did naturally the exposure therapy and the reframing. I circled back around the table and got some more turkey and some more um, salami. And um, at dinner, I had a little extra butter. And yeah. so I don't know. What do you think about that? I, I, lo I love the way uh, you, you did it in a way, uh, and I guess it is exposure a little bit because that is what I, well, for me, the biggest thing is there's the follow following day. I've done it enough where I know what it's going to feel like after. So this totally. is the part that really pops into my head. It's like, oh, that sounds good. Oh, that sounds bad because I'm going to feel this bad. So, and usually automatically I'm like, okay, you know, even though I'm not hungry, I still want to get the meat. And if I want it after that, let me get the meat, see if I want it after that. And every time I've not wanted it after that, even if I didn't like the meat at that time, it doesn't matter. Just a little bit of something seems to erase all of that intensity. Mm. I babied myself a little bit too. Like I made sure I had steak with breakfast this morning. And so like for me, just knowing how my body responds to different foods and I happen to have some ribeyes, it's, it's like, that's my extra insurance policy. And so yeah. I kind of buffer it on all the sides, but I hear what Amy's saying. She's like, we don't want to have to go back and prime every little time we question ourselves, you know? Yeah, yeah exactly. You know, it's funny what you mentioned when you mentioned breakfast, you know, what came up in my mind? And that's always been a old habit. Breakfast used to be cereal for me. Ugh. And that actually came up, Rice Krispie and, uh, and milk. That still comes up. I don't know why. Isn't that interesting? But I just saw it right now. And I felt it in my gut. So it's interesting to hear a cue and you actually feel it, right? I'm acknowledging it. And then I actually think to myself, oh, that sounded good. And I did think that, and this was quick. This was like a millisecond. Yeah. What's interesting is to notice it. How, how, how is that right now? Of course, I'm not going to go upstairs and have a cereal or anything like that, but it's interesting that I heard breakfast and that triggered all this. What I'm trying to say is that that is something we need to watch out for trigger words. What actually triggers us to want a certain carbs and observe it and learn from it. And it's okay to feel it. Remember, all feelings are like in a wave. They go up and then you totally forget about them a little later on. What was I talking about again? There it is, see? Yeah, I, was, I saw that Phyllis wrote, I am not drawn to sugar, but I'm a binge eater. When stressed, I eat until uncomfortably stuffed. So yeah. should I white knuckle through the desire to stuff? And I, just like we talk about body composition is made in the kitchen, not in the gym, 99.9% .9 diet, right? So yes. this whole process is still 99.9% .9 priming, eating enough Yes. because coach Emily, when she's in there in the store and she sees the bunnies, if she chooses on her eating day, not to eat that day because she falls into that same mentality that we do where we're like, I'm not that hungry. I'm going to take advantage of this day and not eat. You do that so much. Coach Raymond says most carnivores under eat. Yes. So that recipe under eating, still feeling life stresses. And then also having that mentality, the less I eat, the better I'll look, the better I'll feel. Right. All that's wrong, right? Yep, because if you don't eat on your eating days, the chocolate bunny is going to hit Coach Emily that much harder. Yes, that's dangerous. So not only that, but then on that day, when she is saying her casual statement, she's also thinking, I'll eat some meat and fat now mm -hmm. when I get home. Because you want to keep it unemotional. But there's still emotion involved. There's still a brain thing that's evoking all this desire to eat the bunny. But you need both sides. You need to eat and you need mm -hmm. to manage your stress. I think. That's it. Now, what's interesting, I want to say this. Have, have you ladies noticed that, you know, when I 
wake up. I don't wake up stressed. But near the end of the night, I usually have this stress feeling, like especially when I want to relax. And of course, throughout the day, there's a little bit of stress. So it depends on how much stress I've had throughout the day. But when I let go, when I get home, I seem to feel like I'm nagging and looking for something. Do you know what I mean? Do you ever feel that? Yeah, that's that's pretty interesting to notice. Now, how to deal with it is the question. How do we reprogram ourselves to actually, you know, note first, the, the, the first thing to do is notice. We notice it. The second we do, the second thing we do is probably put strategy in, is in place. A strategy that's good to do is perhaps eat right when you get home. That's one of the things because it lowers the stress, but we're talking about eating carnivore foods. And should you be looking for extra stuff along the way? Having those cheese snacks are very handy. Having snacks is actually not such a bad thing. And for those people who are fasting and insist on fasting, that's okay. Just put yourself in a couple hour window or three hour window where you're just allowing yourself to eat at all those times. And that actually handles that portion. A lot of people are like, oh man, I can't eat after I just finished eating for 15 minutes, but I have this little nag. And what happens when we ignore that little nag that we have is it, it, it may go away, but then it comes back like a real surprise right before bed. And then you're, you're looking at chocolate milk inside of your fridge and you're like, <laughs> all right. Uh, and you're not even thinking about it. I'm having that right before bed. You know, so the idea is, is to make sure that we're aware of our stressful time eating first and then allowing ourselves to have carnivore snacks, not withholding snacks altogether away from us. Eventually you won't need it, but at first when you're training your body, use those carnivore snacks to your advantage. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. When you're first getting going. I love that. Wow. And go ahead, yeah, Amy. Go ahead. You go, Coach. Nope. I was just going to say that uh, Coach Emily and Coach Raymond have a reputation to keep, but I do not since I don't have a reputation yet. And I, so when we're talking about bumps and the carnivore journey, um, my daughter who eats paleo, <clears throat> so I've talked about this before. People will say you only eat meat and fat. And then I say, yes, unless I'm cheating on paleo, my daughter's paleo cookies or oh, some grain free chips. Mm -hmm. And the reason I say that is because I want to be a perfect carnivore. Like I see uh, Raymond and Emily, but of course I'm not. And so I have found that certain things, like I eat a lot of salami and cheese. I eat the Tillamook sugar-free beef sticks. Those are my go-to snacks that Coach Ram is talking about. Those are carnivore snacks. But if I eat, I have designated in my brain, it's not logical, but in my brain I designated that if I have one of these paleo cookies or if I have a few grain-free chips that it doesn't trigger me. I decided that in my brain. Hmm. It's not. It's not, uh, right. there's That's no valid, yeah, there's just, yes, yes. Stupid thing. but I did. And I ate a regular cookie at some point and it did trigger me and it had more crap in it than the paleo cookie. But mm -hmm. I also doesn't, I didn't designate that paleo or that non paleo cookie as a safe food for me. Right. So I've done this almost since the beginning. I used to get uh, roasted cashews that had nothing but salt on them. And that was my safe cheat. And it didn't make me eat the whole thing. I didn't eat the whole thing. I didn't even eat that many of them. But I must have been doing that since the beginning to keep myself carnivore. And we talk about bridges. Like uh, your bridge might just be seltzer that has the flavor in it that's not ideal but that's what a lot of us buy and that might be your bridge or your bridge might be that you still have coffee with heavy cream in it you might be bridging for a decade on carnivore you might bridge forever 
but it might keep you carnivore. Exactly. Like uh, Laura Spath, I always bring this up because she still has a Diet Coke every day. Oh, she's that's that's most, yes. I didn't most know that. Know every that. day. Wow. Every day. And oh. she'll talk about that occasionally. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's not, that's not acceptable in our community. Right. But no. <clears throat> it's a, it's a can. truth. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's a truth. She has one every day and she had it as a bridge. She would drink it icy. It would be For icy. Her. So mm -hmm. what does that tell us? It tells us that uh, one of the most famous carnivores, we, most of us know her face. Still has a Diet Coke every day. And that tells you how strong our addiction or whatever word you want to use to call it. It tells you how strong it is. And so when you're listening to Coach Emily and Coach Raymond, it's not that they don't struggle with that, but they've overcome most of it due to time. And it also means that you're not necessarily going to be perfect and you might reintroduce some foods but you can still get all the health benefits that are coming to you from carnivore, even if you have these bridges, it's still possible. I love that. Yeah, we don't have to have perfection is the enemy of good. And there's a lot of things that we can work on. And maybe we can, maybe we have some black and white thinking in the carnivore community. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I still keep in cheese, you know, and some, some carnivores don't really like that idea at all, you know. So I keep that, I keep yogurt, you know. Um, so some carnivores don't even use salt, you know. Right, right. Or there's no, there are some carnivore communities that don't advocate for any fasting. Right. Right. And what's interesting, actually, if we look at that, we each one of them has their own little nuance. For example, you could say you could look at me and say, oh, I have uh, I have my cheese. Uh, we could look at Emily and say, oh, she has her coffee, you know, um, right. Amy <laughs> you too. Know? Right. Amy, too. Right. So we could look at that. Uh, Bella does, too. Um, so it's like, yeah. OK, when we're eliminating everything, I want to say the journey the pleasure for the journey is the most important what can we keep that will make it pleasurable okay mm -hmm. so if it's one diet coke a day whatever i know a guy who's uh, who's who's doing carnivore and he has one whiskey a night oh wow and he has all the success mm -hmm. you know i'm not gonna bash that because it's working for him to me let's not get so caught up in our dogma that we don't realize the success of of what these carnivores are doing even though they're keeping this one thing in they're still getting all of the success now we could always say oh wow well if you gave that up you could uh xyz sure maybe but then you could also fall off and not be on carnivore either yes that could make <laughs> you flip out exactly that could make you like this is unsustainable i just can't do this if this one thing that does and keeps you carnivore, fine, keep it in and it doesn't affect anything else. Now, don't get me wrong. If you're super sick, like I was, I didn't have the choice. Don't get me wrong. Cheese does affect me in a negative way also. Okay. So I do put on a little bit of weight with cheese. Uh, we'll call it inflammation. So, but is it bad enough where I'm going to be like, oh, I don't want cheese anymore. It also helps me eat more too. It helps me eat more meat. So I'm like, I justify it. Let's put it that way. But either way, I've been a six year carnivore and I'm not going to take that card away from myself because I'm eating cheese. Mm -hmm. We're talking about carnivore food triggers in the comments. And I, I would do want to hear some feedback because uh, someone's saying the brown, the brown butter can be a trigger. I just saw before that cheese can be a trigger. They have the certain toffee, you know, kind of, kind of a, a palette to it. Um, I, I guess I want to hear a couple of thoughts about carnivore trigger foods. No, I love that, that, that was brought up because if you think about it and you know, there's a trigger, it's, 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 if you know, it's a trigger, you got to stay away from it. It's just, no yeah, it. I it's agree. Kinda like saying I'm going to be with a spouse that triggers me all the time or some friend that triggers me all the time and I'm going to be around them and I love to be around them. Why? You don't have to. Just choose. Now, if it's something that doesn't affect you or trigger you, yeah, it's good to keep 
it, it's fine to keep in as long as there's no trigger or negative, too much negative to it. If there is, then it just needs to be out. Yeah. Thoughts, Amy? I just saw Phyllis said cheese, salami, sausage, and hot dogs. Those are all staples in my carnivore diet, but they trigger Phyllis. So, but I know that uh, Cadbury mini eggs, I won't touch one because I know that one might be the start restart of those gummy bears in my, in my hand where I have to go all the way back and, and mm. gain all the way back. That could happen. I mean, it's not an overly dramatic thing to say that for us, how many of us have done that. And so, so blanket things like all, all sugar or all like the, the paleo cookies, they don't trigger me. They're, they taste good, but they're not, <laughs> they're not a Snickers bar. For some reason, <laughs> excuse me, I've decided they're not a trigger for me, but a Snickers bar would be. I like what you're saying. And to me, I think trigger equals sabotage. When we talk about cheat meals, a sabotage meal, but I like taking a neutrality in that whole thing. And, you know, we free, free will, we can think about that from either side and identify that as, as we're going to go that, but do we want to start the journey over? And do we want to go back to our ground one of effort? We put in a lot of effort. We've worked really hard to get where we are. And when that question comes up about why don't you eat non-carnivore foods, I'm like, do you know how hard I worked? Like, I don't want to start over. <laughs> so right. that's a, that, right. that's a motivator for me. Right. And, 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 you know, it's going to be different from different people that you ask, right? You're going to, you know, for example, your triggers are not going to be my triggers too. So yeah. let's realize that. One of the things that I love to talk on the Steak and Butter Gang is all of our journeys are very unique because we are all unique individuals. And that's why we need to respect what a person's journey is going about. There are people out there that will do just keto with, with, with us. And that's fine. That's their journey. Now, our target is mostly for the sick. And like Miss E's comment about her being, you know, she has no choice but to be lying. Uh, yeah, I get that. I mean, this this is terrible to 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 feel to feel so restrictive. But you know what? What's more terrible is feeling that poor health. Mm -hmm. She knows this. Quality of health first, and then hey, if, if that's all I can eat, that's all I can eat. Look, if I had to only eat that. And uh, I, I, I knew that was the only thing that, that would get me away. I'm fine by it because you know why? I have the answer. Once you know the answer, you have the power. The rest is choice. Yeah. And I like that, that Coach Emily used that word sabotage because I think about this so much because I probably, when I say I was deciding if I wanted to live or die, that's the truth because <clears throat> when you're eating all this stuff that's making you pre-diabetic or diabetic, killing your kidneys or make, giving you autoimmune disease, whatever's going on with you, you're, you're, die, you're choosing to die a slow death. Oh. And it's not going to be something that's quick. It's long and drawn out. And that's what you're choosing. But when you, when you make the choice to try to be carnivore, you're actually going against your brain's function. And so that whole notion of sabotage is you being defiant against how your obese person brain reacts to things. And, you know, you see those brain scan, those brain things where it shows a cocaine addict's brain and then next to it, an obese person's brain. And they're the same dopamine serotonin levels and that's because you choose not to sabotage yourself and choose to live. You're going against your brain's own inclinations. That's a really big deal. So when you make that choice, it's a brave thing. It's not an easy thing, but mm -hmm. it's a brave thing. And it's against your own nature. And that's amazing. That's phenomenal that we, that we're not controlled by our impulses anymore. That's our, that's like our huge, uh, the biggest human potential Big that winner. we have is leveraging choice.
And uh, I do feel really proud of myself when I when I make those kinds of cho choices. And like for me, beef is my safety food. Ruminant animals are what just sustains me. It's like my vitamin, my sanity. And so I feel like I'm really making choices out of my wise self when I do that. And then even folks like that are that need to be on a lion, I just think wisdom, wisdom. And it's just, it motivates me. And I've heard uh, Jordan Peterson say, do you like eating a beef only diet? He says, no, I hate no, it. I hate and it, he no. says it in that grouchy voice, just no. like he is. He does you know? hate that. Even his daughter says she'd like to yeah. reintroduce foods. We don't want to be carnivore, right? Right. <laughs> we came here as a last resort. I want. Yeah. I just can't. I just cannot do anything else. If I do, I it, it, it's a terrible health. And that choice that I have, for me, it is about how I operate out there. It's not about that food pleasure in my mouth anymore. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we yeah. can't yeah. help it that now that we did it, yeah. we're, you know, smarter uh, and where, you know, we can't help it that we had all these benefits and now we know the secret, but we didn't want right. to do it right. <laughs> we didn't want to find out that secret, right? <laughs> I mean, let's be honest. Now it's the ultimate secret sauce. Uh, Raymond, you mentioned pleasure that you want our carnivore journey to be pleasure based. And it was so interesting the way that the brain changes and the way that feedback changes over years. Cause I'm at that three and a half year point where you said that word, the first thing that jumped into my mind was a crust on a ribeye steak. Oh, I was like, oh, that's, that's the pleasure that. right yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so it was kind of cool. Ribeye on an open fire. Mm -mm -mm. Yeah, yeah, just that hot sear. And yeah. um, gosh, mm -hmm. I saw uh, Adam did a, a ribeye. I don't know how he did it. I just saw it come across in his uh, Instagram. When I was looking at Instagram, I was like, oh, I just, it just took my breath away. So even what we consider to be pleasurable kind of changes over time, I guess. Well, it is. I mean, if you think yeah. about it, I, I never thought I'd ever say, oh, you know, fasting is uh, pleasurable. I can't wait to yeah. fast tomorrow, you know, because that's that's going to be a cool day because I'm not doing anything, you know, uh, as far as doing anything like eating. So I would have never thought I'd say that, you know, that that became a pleasure for me. Pleasure yeah. to me is being able to order a size off of Amazon in a piece of clothing and it actually fits when it gets to my house. That's a pleasure for me. You know, that's funny you said that. Yeah. So late, lately, lately, uh, cause I, I, I just, um, so I have small shirts now, which is unusual that I can actually wear it. You know, I'm a fairly big guy. Emily, you see me, right? I'm a pretty big guy, right? But I can wear a small shirt. Now saying that I've actually, I'm actually at right about, and I weighed myself, which I don't know why I did that, but I weighed myself. I, I weighed myself at uh, 210. This year we've gone on so many vacations. That I didn't really get to fast much and I still can wear the small size. And I'm like, how does wow. that work? You know, it doesn't make sense. I'm wearing a small guys. Okay. I'm talking about where a double XL was, I was popping out of that. So that doesn't make sense. It's almost like I can wear almost whatever I choose. It just fits because I don't have that belly in the way, I guess. I don't know. But I'm. if you look at me, you would never think I'm a small guy. That's amazing. So, And that's for men, of course. But I, I know for women, it's very different. Well, we're getting close. I want to hit some of our questions that we haven't covered. Yeah. That I've seen posted here, and we'll try to get as many as we can. Uh, from Amco, let's see. I don't think we covered this. I'm having a hard time giving up artificial sweeteners. Eating nothing but savory food overwhelms my palate, and it begins to taste bitter. Oh, struggling to quit diet pop. Help. No, diet pop's the, the hardest. But um, okay, giving up artificial sweetener. The thing is, is the best thing is to re reprogram your mind to say, "Hey, I'm allowed to have artificial sweetener after my carnivore foods." That's the best thing you can do. You're not preventing yourself and do that with the diet pop. And then eventually what you do with the diet pop is you start mixing it with like a, a fizzy water. So, you, you know, your, your, your half a can is going to be quite a bit. You won't taste the difference because you'll still taste the Diet Coke. Um, and then what you do is you dilute it more and more as you go along the way because you won't need as much of a, 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 a kick later on. 
but that's all initial. It's okay. What else? Awesome. awesome. Uh, I have a question here from Gayla. Um, have any of the women, so I guess Amy and I'll answer this, used amino acids to heal their gut and the brain and the gut working together? An addiction is a brain connection. Oh, wow. I want to Julia Ross. Julia Ross. Julia Ross, yes. Yeah. So, Julia Ross. When she's asking about the gut and brain, she means that I would say addiction the reprogramming of that. And that's a really good point. That's one of the things I have to admit that carnivore does do is to realign the gut and brain. And you're alluding to amino acid. What's familiar with uh, the carnivore diet? Carnivore diet's full of amino acids, all of the essential amino acids. So eventually that does work. Uh, I can say that the amino acids boost it to another level. So at least for me. So even though if you're eating a bunch of carnivore foods, sometimes because of digestion, we're just not getting everything that we can. So a little bit of addition to, to amino acids did help me. I kind of took a chapter. I took an amino acid chapter. I think it was maybe three or four months where I supplemented with them and it definitely felt some benefit and then just really stopped wanting them anymore. Ooh, is that called the craving? Craving cure. Julia yeah. Ross. So okay. that Julia Ross. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, Amy, I want to hear from you about that, the craving cure. So I started, I've known about Julia Ross for a long time just because of Hannah's OCD. And I actually, I think I read the diet cure before even that one of the many times I tried to lose weight and Julia Ross um, specializes in amino acids for your mood and your diet. And she <clears throat> has a quiz you take the quiz and then the quiz spits out what kind of amino acids you might use for your gut and for all your cravings and for your brain function. And I, I use uh, amino acids right now, uh, the perfect aminos along with the coaches. And I have used many of the amino acids in there for a year for a couple decades but i will say that there are advantages to that however you know when you become carnivore like coach says you're eating meat and the meat has amino acids so you're you're in a great spot that's amazing okay i've got one more and then we're going to wrap it up this is our last question tonight um Let's see. I found myself tired throughout the day. And then I wake up more towards the evening doing carnivore about seven weeks. Any thoughts on what I can do to help the situation? Ah, okay. So uh, in, interesting. Your, your cycle, your uh, circadian rhythm. Mm -hmm. seems yeah. to That's very interesting. Mm. What are you thinking, Emily? So seven weeks in, um, yeah, my burst, my energy was up and down, I think tired. Okay. So my first thought is for Estera K is have they considered priming nourishing kind of a start to things? Because a lot of times when people initially start carnivore, they under eat. And so they're not getting enough energy and their body's not used to using energy from fat stores quite yet. So that's my first thought is to gear towards priming. We teach that in the steak and butter gang. Monday. We just talked about it a couple hours ago. <laughs> so, um, and then, yeah, my second thought is that would be circadian rhythm. Exactly what uh, Raymond's talking about. And to me, the easiest, freest way to deal with that is light, morning light, um, and uh, potentially like eating, grounding, early, okay, shifting things. Oh, grounding. Is that what she said, coach? Yeah. No, okay. I would say grounding. Yeah. 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 Awesome. I would definitely try grounding. That that will help get your rhythm back in motion. Very cool. Okay, cool, cool, cool. So listen, you guys, we are over at the Steak and Butter Gang almost every day. And so if you guys want to come over and get incredible advice from these beautiful coaches and join our community, please check that out. Um, we have a lady community on Facebook that uh, uh, Lindy's been really faithful to get that going. So yeah, we just are excited. We're just here just improving our lives in every way that you know we can think of. And it all comes down to having a meat-based approach because the nutrition's first. We get our nutrition fixed. The rest of it kind of comes along and oh, 
I just want to thank you guys for hanging out with me tonight. I love you both oh my so sure. much. You. You're so precious to me. And thanks for everybody that came. And um, yeah, we'll just, uh, Lindy and I will be here again next Monday. And then Raymond and Amy and I are just in the gang all the time. So <laughs> come and see us there. Yeah, we'll be there tomorrow, actually. So thanks, great. you guys. Thanks, Emily. Awesome. Beautiful. Love y'all. Good night, everybody. See you next Good night. time.